We'll begin this half hour with uh, that word that is dominating domestic headlines this morning, and that is nuclear. The opposition's finally released aspects of its nuclear energy policy. Reactors are slated for seven sites on retiring coal-fired power stations around the country. And this has uh, very much set up a fight with Labor over the future of energy in this country and the best way to decarbonise and fight climate change. The Federal Energy Minister, Chris Bowen, has uh, made his feelings pretty clear about this. He's labelled the Coalition's new nuclear power plan a scam that lacks detail. He's slammed the opposition for not actually announcing a cost. They can't even confirm that these details will be released before an election, not after. The Liberals and Nationals promised you a sensible energy plan. Instead, they're giving you a risky nuclear scam. The Coalition says it's aiming to get the first two reactors up and running by as early as 2035, between 2035 and 2037, is what we were told yesterday after that SNAP Coalition meeting. So can it be done? Tony Irwin is an ANU Associate Professor and Technical Director at SMR Nuclear Technology. That's a company that's looking at small modular reactor technology and uh, options there for Australia. He joins us now. Morning to you, Tony. Good morning, Tom. Thanks for being with us. What do you make of the plan? I think the plan recognises that we need at least part of the electricity generation system that's not weather dependent or very weather dependent. If you look at the NEM yesterday, there was hardly any wind in the the whole of the NEM. Uh, There's a very good website called opennem.com .org.au, which your listeners can have a look at and see for themselves. And and it's very seasonal dependent as well. You know, solar goes down to sort of 14% in winter and up to 27% in December and, and winds the same. So I think we need something that's more weather uh, independent. And then if you look at the countries that have been successful in reducing emissions, they have uh, either unlimited hydro or hydro and nuclear. And the least successful ones are the ones with high renewables like Germany. You know, places like South Australia on a good day can be 100%, on a bad day can be less than 10%. And it's trying to, I think, eliminate some of this variability and get some reliability into the system. Okay, so let's just look at a, a, a few things that you've raised there. You've said what makes nuclear, in your view, such an attractive option for Australia, but feasibility is certainly questioned here. So we've got until, according to the Coalition's plan, Tony, we have until 2035, I just want to list a few things, to overturn yeah. bans. Let's not forget, uh, state premiers and some of the Liberal opposition leaders have uh, expressed concern about this. So bans on nuclear power, creating a whole regulatory infrastructure and workforce, squaring the pans off against likely stiff community opposition, which I imagine there will be in some areas, and then actually build these nuclear reactors. I mean, that does seem like a lot, doesn't it? Particularly as the opposition would first you know, need to win an election as well. Right. Yes. I mean, the first thing is that we've been a nuclear nation since 1958 when we started the, the first reactor. So we're not starting from scratch. We've already got a world-class nuclear safety regulator in our panzer and, and a safety authorities and a lot of the infrastructure. So you're not... You're not Do, we don't have a lot of the infrastructure that. for widespread nuclear power, though. Yes, exactly, because all we need is, the, is to reuse the existing transmission system. Mm. I mean, we're, we're um, signatures to all the major conventions... So, you know, a lot of the nuclear is is already in place. I I understand that was Peter Dutton's argument yesterday, that we're building it on the sites of old coal-fired power stations where the existing transmission infrastructure is there. I get that. But isn't the big cost and the big issue with feasibility and the time is the fact you've actually got to build the reactors, not just using the existing lines? No. So the the whole idea of using the existing coal-fired power stations is you've got the transmission there, the, the big transmission that's already there. So... You save one of the big problems that they're getting with renewables into trying to move renewables from remote areas. But you've got the rest of the infrastructure, like the cooling water supplies. But importantly, you've got the staff. You know, you retrain the staff for the nuclear power plant. Huge community benefits. So this is what we did in the UK. This is what Bill Gates is doing in, in Wyoming, in, in the USA. USA. 
because most of the, the plant of a nuclear power plant is exactly the same as a, a coal-fired plant. If you're a turbine operator, you're a turbine operator, you know, and you can train people on the, the nuclear part of it, yeah. like we did for the new Opal reactor. We had to, you know, get all new staff, train them, and and get them into operation. We've been canvassing different sides of the argument uh, on this program, obviously, with regards to nuclear and, and uh, with your expertise, Tony, you, you say it's a, it's a favourable option for Australia. But just you mentioned South Australia there a moment ago, and I just want to go back to that because the government's made its feelings clear. It wants to press on with renewables. South Australia, which is slated for a reactor as part of the coalition's list there, it's planned to be 100% renewable in just a few years' time, and government analysis says nuclear, it's just far more expensive than renewables. I mean, the government says press on. We're actually quite close to getting to that point. Shouldn't we press on? We're nowhere near. If you look at South Australia, you know, on a good day, yes, it, it, it is. On a bad day, you know, then it's it's uh, gas and imports from, from, uh, from Victoria. Again, look at the Open NEM website, and you you can see um, last last week, and particularly last May, there was no wind at all in 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 any of the the NEM. Mm. That's um, wind. What about combining or what what about combining wind, solar, hydro, offshore wind, uh, with the use of batteries as well? There's a lot that goes into the renewable mix, is there not? Yeah, but look at batteries aren't making hardly any contribution. Again, just just look at the actual yeah. figures. Wind frequently is is very low. You know, the, at least solar, the sun comes up every day, so you, you've got that in the daytime. But as soon as the sun goes down, um, it's a problem. Mm. There's a lot I want to um, canvas you in, with you in this interview, Tony. But the the other uh, the other issue is is uranium. I just want to get your thoughts on that because Australia produces a lot of it, right? But we don't enrich it. It's not as simple as digging it up and feeding it into a reactor. We'd have to build enrichment facilities or buy enriched uranium from overseas. Am I, am I right in saying that? I mean, that could simply just jack up the cost of, of energy. No, we, we, we've got twice as much uranium resources than anywhere else in, in the world, and we're the third biggest producer. But if you, you look at countries that use nuclear power, most of them have to import the, the fuel. There's, you know, there's there's very few countries. In fact, there's there's no countries in the world that are totally independent on their on their fuel cycle. There's this interchange of, of fuel and materials, you know, throughout the world, and that's that's routine. Yeah. So, but what what are you saying we do here, though? Just to clarify, would we have to build our own enrichment f- facility? Would it become you routine in your words that we buy it and bring it in from overseas? Yeah. I mean, most countries buy it and bring it in from. From overseas, so initially at, l- at least we do that. I mean, longer term, it would be great to to increase the value of our uranium by doing you no know, enrichment, and and we've got our own silex the technology that we you know we can't use in this country. That that would be fabulous to have that as well. And- you now, know, the real opportunities. Obviously, there there are different people in the community who who feel differently about that. Mixed views, of, of course. But uh, what? How do you stand on the issue? And, and this has obviously led to some community opposition or concern at this point about what we do with the nuclear waste. Right. So the day to day waste from a nuclear power plant is only low level waste. So it's things like clothing, cleaning materials, resins, filters, goes into a a, a barrel. Um, you know, sort of 200 litre barrels. Um, it produces about 120 metre cubed a year from a big nuclear power plant, which is about two shipping containers of low level waste. And you can stand by this stuff. And, you know, there's a shed full of an opal waiting for a, a low level repository. So th- the day to day is is easily managed. So you've then just got the spent fuel to manage. So the, the, the spent fuel, when it comes out of the reactor, uh, everybody puts it into a cooling pond initially. So the, the water provides cooling and shielding. It stays there for probably five years, and then you've got a number of options. So you can put it into interim storage in a dry cask like they do in US and Canada at the moment. You can send it for recycling. So the fuel from the Opal reactor, sorry, uh, Lucas Heights, goes to France, uh, recycled, extracts the uranium for reuse. You get back a, a small amount of, of vitrified waste. 
Yeah. Or you can put it into deep geological facilities like they're doing in Finland, Sweden. But Finland stands the out there. Sorry to interrupt. I've got to let you go on a minute. Forgive me. But Finland stands out there, right? My understanding there's really nowhere in the world that's, that's actually a point where they have a permanent waste facility. Finland's as close well, as we've gotten. Finland's built. Uh, they're just waiting to get their construction, their um, operating license. That's all built. Sweden's the same. France is very well established as well. But there's borehole technology as well, which would be excellent for, for uh, <coughs> Australia. Okay. Tony, it's uh, great to hear your thoughts. Thanks for coming on the program with us this morning. Appreciate your time.